Hello and welcome to Serial of Midnight. My name is Heath and this is our monthly look at every single release from Kino Lorber and Kino Lorber's partner labels. This is February 2023. Uh, actually, there are a few titles that are not here. Uh, there were four titles that were scheduled for release on February 28th. It was the last day of February that didn't show up in time for this video. Uh, if they show up, you know, later, I will cover them hopefully in a future video. Uh, but this is over two dozen releases. And I want to thank Kino Lorber for sending these over because I love to make this video every single month. You guys love it too because I see the numbers. I see the feedback. We love Kino, right? Because it's such a, uh, they put out so many different kinds of movies all eras, all genres. For people that love movies, Kino Lorber is uh, just the best. So thanks to Kino Lorber. Hey, by the way, one more thing. If you enjoyed my first interview with Frank Tarzi, the acquisition, yeah, that's right. I said my first interview with Frank Tarzi from Kino Lorber. Uh, stay tuned because in the next few days, I'm dropping something pretty cool on my channel here. If you want some insight into further insight into what's going on with Kino Lorber, what's coming down the line, maybe an announcement or two that you won't be seeing anywhere else that will be breaking news right here. Stay tuned. Uh, all right, let's kick it off with Marathon Man on 4K. This is the uh, the Dustin Hoffman thriller. Great cast on this. It's got Roy Scheider, Lawrence Olivier, uh, William Devane, who I always like to see. Rolling Thunder is a movie that is uh, great and maybe not talked about enough. Uh, it, this is a... 1976 movie from the maybe the pinnacle the heyday of that paranoid thriller uh you could do a whole you could do a whole deep dive on those 70s paranoia movies where you know like they're coming for you uh the government who who is coming you know the shadowy organizations they they have your number and they're coming for you uh that's this movie you will never look at uh dental work the same way again nobody loves dental work but this movie forever changes uh, uh. Uh, I'm happy to report I was going to do a full 4k review on this but time just ran out because hey February is a short month uh, this looks really good this comes from Paramount this is a Paramount uh, movie but a brand new HDR Dolby Vision Master from a 4k scan of the original camera negative so I don't know if this was something that Kino Lorber was like hey what you have in the vaults let's do a fresh scan on something I don't know I do know that when I compare this to other recent Paramount uh, releases, 4Ks, I'm thinking specifically Saturday Night Fever, which was like, what, like four or five months ago? It wasn't that long ago. I reviewed Saturday Night Fever. Uh, Paramount, generally, on a lot of their transfers, they don't like grain. Someone at Paramount, the, the team, the restoration team at Paramount, seems to not like grain very much. In fact, I just, you know, I did an interview with uh, David C. Fine, who was the producer like the head producer on Star Trek The Motion Picture, the director's edition for Paramount, at Paramount. And he talked about, in that video, which you can go watch right now, he talked about how they removed every bit of grain from the movie because it was chunky and, you know, composite shots and effect shots, all that. I know why. But they removed every bit of grain and then they artificially inserted grain back in. Now, that's a special case because it's Star Trek. It's a whole director's kind of a thing. But Paramount at large just does not seem to enjoy grain. This is a grainy transfer. This is now not like, not like, uh, ooh, it's so grainy. This is a natural filmic transfer. This is what I want. Me being, you know, a retro movie fan, when I see a, a, a classic movie from 1976 shot on film, I want to see grain. The grain is here. I see no signs of DNR. Uh, the colors look consistent. It doesn't have like the teal thing. It doesn't have the orange thing. It's just like a straight, clear uh, 4k scan of the uh, of the original camera negative so it looks really good that being said it's a 70s movie okay so it's got it's not super sharp that's the, there's a style that whole slightly soft focus thing that was going on in the 70s is evident here but I feel very comfortable saying this is the best the movie has ever looked maybe the best the movie's ever going to look too uh, who knows what the future holds but uh, for now this is the top of the mountain we got an audio commentary by Steve Mitchell and Nathaniel Thompson the magic of Hollywood the original making of the marathon man uh, going the distance remembering marathon man rehearsal footage theatrical trailer the 4k disc itself is uh, it only has the commentary there's no alternate artwork here either by the way uh, the special features on the blu-ray so um, I, I, it's a movie that I don't watch it super often, but sometimes it's not every 4K that I cover is like 
the one I'm going to go to from now on. It's not an instant, like an automatic replacement for Blu-ray for me. Like there are others, some Christmas movies that just came out. Man, Saturday Night Fever is a great example. I don't know that I'm going to watch the 4K for Saturday Night Fever. I might just go back to the Blu-ray because it, there's so many, it's so revisionist to what I'm used to. And I'm, just, I'm not even saying that's right or wrong, but Marathon Man, that's my go-to now, 4K. Uh, we have not one, not two, seven Truffo movies hitting Blu-ray during February. Uh, this is pretty outstanding. And in that thing that's coming with Frank Tarzi, we talked about this. So stay tuned. Because uh, it's like, I mean, it's kind of a thing, right? Like seven Truffaut movies all at one time. So we start off with this four, four film uh, pack here. So we've got uh, The Wild Child, a Small Change, The Man Who Loved Women, and The Green Room. Uh, 1970, 1976, 1977, and 1978. Now there are no... Um, it's, it's fairly bare bones. We have theatrical trailers, two movies on each Blu-ray. Uh, what are the running times on these? Do we have running times? Here we go. Uh, 83 minutes, 104 minutes, 120 minutes, and 94 minutes. So uh, compression-wise, that should be okay. I think if it was an issue, they wouldn't have done it. They've done these double, like two movies on a disc before, and it was fine. So... I know that's sometimes a red flag for collectors, but I mean, guys, it's four Truffaut movies for, you know, a a relatively, Im a lower impact entry point is I guess what I'm trying to say. The Bride Wore Black, Truffaut. Uh, this is a 1970, what is the year on this? Oh, 68. Um, uh, Truffaut film with, uh, I'll review these later. <laughs> I, what do you guys think about my one minute? I'm starting to do uh, one minute movie reviews on YouTube shorts. Like, I know, like, YouTube wants to compete with TikTok, and I don't really understand that because YouTube has the thing that TikTok doesn't, which is long, the possibility for long, unbroken interviews. Like, you guys are watching this video. Um, I see the analytics. Most of you guys stick with these things for 15, 20, 30, some of you, most of you stick through to the very end for however long it goes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. TikTok can't compete with that. They're going to have to keep serving you things. I don't know why YouTube is like, well, we want to have the, I mean, I guess they want to have everything, but it's Google and Google wants to dominate, right? So I've struggled with like, well, what do I, what would I do with a short? And I've tried a few things. I really like the idea of one minute movie reviews because uh, it's just, it's easily approachable, right? It, at worst, you've lost one minute and it doesn't take a lot of editing. So I, you stay tuned, you know, as I, as I lean further into that, uh, you'll see reviews for these these things popping up there. You, uh, audio commentary uh, by Julie Kurgo, Stephen C. Smith, and Nick Redman. Theatrical trailer. All right, we're still talking Truffaut. We got two more here. We've got Mississippi Mermaid, uh, which is Jean-Paul Belmondo, Catherine Dinueve. Din Din I'm going to hear from you guys. Uh, 1969. Um, audio commentary by Julie Kurgo and Nick Redman again. Theatrical trailer. There's a really noisy airplane flying over. It threw me a little bit. Do you guys hear that? There's so every time I record, I like it'll be quiet. And then I hit record, and then like somebody like cranks up a chainsaw or something. It's not Leatherface either. It's just one of the neighbors. Uh, here's the last Truffaut film from February: The Story of Adele H. The H stands for Hugo. Uh, this is connected to like uh, the Victor Hugo uh, story. Um, audio commentaries by uh, Julie Kurgo and Nick Redman again. This is 1975. So between the six Truffaut, uh, sorry, the seven Truffaut films, we've got uh, spanning 68 to what was it, 79? Hold on, now I've. Why did I? Why did I do that? Why did I put myself in that corner? 78. So we're spanning a decade of Truffaut. All right, this is one I'm really, really, really excited about. So this is Secret of the Incas. It's people. I don't know. It's the, there are only a few options for a Heston impression. Um, if you, especially if you don't want to go like political and get into like NRA stuff, you have to go with like Planet of the Apes, or you could go with the Omega Man. Uh, I don't know. So the, you could, I guess, go. Hey, we go with Moses too. Um, all right. Anyway, Secret of the Incas is a really, really, really fun movie. It is a huge influence on Indiana Jones, specifically Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, the outfits, pretty much the the leather. I mean, look, look at this. Uh, Central American adventure, 
uh, Pulp's sensibilities. This, uh, now if you're paying attention to just what comes out and where it comes out, you know that Imprint out of Australia released this mm, not too long ago. Secret of the Incas, Secret of the Incas. Uh, Imprint's was from the Paramount Vaults with no restoration. And it does have, like, this one had an audio commentary, uh, an interview with a film historian uh, on the influences of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and then the Lux Radio Theater version of this. So this is not like a throwaway. This is not like, oh, I don't want this. But it did. It came from the Paramount Vaults, and it was, it, had, it was aged. It was not clean. It was not in great shape. So for this Kino Lorber release, we have a remastered in HD from a 4K scan of the 35 millimeter uh, YCMs. Uh, anyway, it's a new 4K scan, so it's a huge improvement. I wish it was 4K, but like that's probably asking too much for Secret of the Ink as well. They sell like, you know, because 4K is super expensive, right? So uh, it has to be profitable. So this is going to be way more profitable than a 4K would. But man, I love this stuff. Uh, audio commentary by Toby Roan, and that's it. But I think, you know, if you are on the fence about which version you should get. Now you have all the information that you need. And I would just continue to remind people that now that Kino Lorber has a partnership deal with Paramount, uh, Imprint is for Australia. Imprint is an Australian product and they don't region, they don't region lock their releases. So that means that everybody can order them. They can import them from wherever, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to get those movies in America. It just means Imprint got them first when that, whenever that's the case. Uh, Australians should definitely be ordering Imprint because they're in Australia. That's their that's their local distributor, but or one of them, right? But for people in the U.S., you know, North America, there's a new license with Paramount from Kino Lorber. So you know, plan accordingly. <laughs> is I guess what I'm saying. Uh, Fred Williamson, that man Bolt. This is awesome. This is 1970. It was a 73, like peak black exploitation era. Brand new 2K master. Uh, Fred Williamson, of course, uh, Fred the Hammer Williamson, Hammer Black Caesar, original gangsters. Um, we've got a uh, that man Hammer, an interview with star Fred Williamson, theatrical trailer. Did this, I think this does have alternate? Yeah, yes, yeah, Y A S S S, yes. Does it have any? Sometimes lately, okay, one of these uh, has three pieces of artwork. Hold on, let me check Secret of the Incas. Did this have? Okay, no. But one, watch, one of these has three pieces of artwork, which I like. It might be this one. I think it's this one. Uh, Steve McQueen in The Hunter, another one that I know people uh, imprint released in Australia. Uh, Americans were interested in this as well. Now it's in the American market, the North American market, the US market. Uh, Paramount title. It, it, Steve, it's great stuff. Steve McQueen, you know, there's only so many Steve McQueen movies. And I'm so glad that these are another one I would have loved to have had in 4K. So 4K scan of the original camera negative. So it's t the only way it could look better is if we had the actual uncompressed 4K version, not shrunken down onto a Blu-ray. Uh, but I'm not complaining. I'm really not complaining. What a what a what a time to be a movie fan when so many of these deep catalogs, not even a deep catalog cut, but so many of these catalog titles are getting 4K scans. 4K scans, guys. So, audio commentary by film historians Steve Mitchell and Nathaniel Thompson. Get ready for it. Gadish. There's two pieces of artwork. And... You know what? I'm going to go ahead and flip it and reverse it. Because I prefer that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. All right, so... Uh, happy that the hunter has a new home in North America. The Crimson Rivers. Um, I remember that. And I haven't watched this edition yet. This Blu-ray edition. I remember when this hit theaters. It was in '99, maybe 2000. Uh, it's from Gaumont or Gaumont, French company or European company for sure. Uh, I think there's different interests in different places, but uh, it's Jean Reno and Vincent Cassel who are both French, I guess they're French superstars, is what I'm going to say. Uh, and this is a really interesting, I remember it being very dark, very, uh, 
probably darker than we could do now because people, I don't know, I feel like we've changed and we don't really go as dark as we used to. It's a super dark movie. Uh, and this is, um, let's see, we got audio commentary by the director and this, both stars, the investigation documentary, the corpse featurette, the car chase featurette, and the mountain sequence featurette. So that's great. And did it have... Oh, oh. Look at that. All right, let's do it. Let's flip it. I feel like uh, Benicio Del Toro and The Usual Suspects. They flip you. They flip you. Flip it. Take the artwork and yeah, flip it. If you haven't watched The Usual Suspects, you got to check out the 4K from Kino Lorber. I love that movie. I'm amazed that it got a release in this particular climate that we're living in right now. Uh, Brian Singer. Kevin Spacey, but you know what? Great movies transcend controversy, and The Usual Suspects is a great movie. Uh, highly recommend it. Just as you could step, people do, you could study that movie for the structure and like neo noir sensibilities. Uh, all right, we're getting deep, guys. We are out of the the cardboard slipcover stuff, and we are entering the deep cuts of Kino Lorber. Really cool stuff here. White Woman pre code. Is this Universal? Yes, Universal. Uh, it's a Paramount production under the Universal umbrella because Universal picked up, I can't remember how many, it's like 600, 800, 900 um, Paramount titles in a deal in the 50s, I was 56, 57. Anyway, it's under the, uh, the Universal umbrella now. It's a pre-code movie with uh, Carol Lombard, who I love. Somewhere back here is the Carol Lombard... Carol Lombard uh, collection one and two is next to it. I don't have to show you that. Uh, so they've really, Keanu Lorber, you know, because Carol Lombard was a contract player for, uh, you know, the studios at that time, we have access to a lot of her catalog and they've been really a brand new 2K master. Um, if you don't know a lot about Carol Lombard, look into her. She's one of the, one of the greats, one of the early Hollywood greats. And she died, um, doing something really really heroic which is you know just go go research and then her 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 love affair with not even an affair just her love with clark gable gable and lombard oh, it's great stuff anyway this has got charles lawson as a i think he's um let's see uh malaysian yeah he's playing so you know again we're already in controversial territory again but it's pre-code man they could do all kinds of stuff back then and uh let's see so you know, it's like a torrid love story set against Charles Lawton as a hard-driving, you know... Let's see, what do they say? The world of a widowed nightclub performer tra changes drastically when she agrees to marry a wealthy plantation owner, Lawton. As the two begin their domestic life together on his remote Malaysian estate, she realizes the extent of his cruel and jealous nature. She finds herself uh, drawn to another man, but must keep their love secret. Oh, from her husband. So you couldn't do that after 1933 or 19, really 1934. Summer 1934 is the end of the, uh, the pre-code era and really the, uh, the crackdown of the decency police and anything remotely resembling real life, get it out of there. So that's why we love pre-codes, right? Uh, this is another one that is really interesting. I have not watched this yet. I'm super excited about it. Uh, the Bliss of Mrs. Blossom. I mean, look, there's a bra on the art, right? And then here she's in her, un this character's in her underwear. So this is one of those 60s, late 60s sex comedies um, with Shirley MacLaine, who I have really, I knew Shirley MacLaine, but when I started to discover her, okay, so like The Apartment, watch The Apartment with Jack Lemmon and Shirley MacLaine and Fred McMurray and don't fall in love with Shirley MacLaine. I don't know if you can do it. She's so great. And, uh, her, her 60s as the 60s go on, she was a leading lady for a while there. And the movies are just so much fun. They are often, uh, funny and irreverent and sexy. And I don't know, there's just something about her that I really, really like. And so this is another, like, this is Richard Attenborough. From Jurassic Park, but of course, many years before. Is that focusing? Focus camera. Um, anyway, so it's a, it's it's a sex comedy. It's a 60s sex comedy. We got an audio commentary by film historian Daniel Kramer. What did this one have? Oh yeah, film uh, audio commentary by Daniel Kramer and Alan Arkush. Oh man, I've talked about this before, but I stumbled onto Alan Arkush's Amazon reviews. 
I was like, is this Alan Arkish? Like the 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 seventies film, and it, it, it is. And the, like the opinions feel like someone of that era. Anyway, uh, so if I were king, so this is uh, Ronald Coleman, Francis D, Basil Rathbone, uh, Ellen Drew, screenplay by Preston Sturgis, produced and directed by Frank Lloyd. The 1938 film, brand new 2K Master. Hold on, did this one have a new 2K Master? Uh, remastered in HD from a 4K scan of the 35mm original camera negative. Mwah. This is good as it gets for Blu-ray. Uh, new 2K Master. Uh, audio commentary by film historian and writer Julie Kurgo. And check this out. Sorrowful Jones, Bob Hope, and Lucille Ball. 1949. 1949. So this is pre-I Love Lucy. If you're not super well-versed in classic Hollywood, uh, you know, I Love Lucy... And hopefully you didn't get your facts about I Love Lucy from that Nicole Kidman movie with Javier Bardem. Uh, I Love Lucy was like just another phase of Lucille Ball's career. She was a bombshell. Oh my goodness. She was like model beautiful. She was a movie star. And she wasn't playing a lot of comedy roles earlier on. She evolved into comedy as she got older. Um, this is obviously a comedy, but you still see like the holdover of like, she was a glamour, a, a glamour woman, a glamour queen. Right. Um, and then of course goes to TV and just becomes like the, Wah! you know, all that stuff. But man, there's a whole other chapter to Lucille Ball's career that you got to check out if you're not familiar with it. Brand new 2K master. Uh, we only have a trailer here, but that's a nice trade off for me. I'll trade special features for a 2K Master if that's if that's uh, the option. I want to see these things looking good, so that's exciting. Um, anything else with William Demarest, Bruce Cabot? Uh, who is the screenwriter and the oh, this Prentice? Okay, uh, and a screenplay by William R. Lipman, Sam Hellman, and Gladys Lehman. Where's the director? Where's the director? Produced by, okay, Sydney Lanford. Sydney Lanfield. I mean, look at how, like, how am I supposed, how am I supposed to read this? I'm getting older, man. I got the glasses. How am I supposed to read this? I don't know. Oh, funny. Uh, Raw, Raw Wind and Eden. Unexpected Godfather. Impressive. Uh, Raw Wind and Eden. Esther Williams, Jeff Chandler. I'm having a blast discovering some of these Jeff Chandler movies through their deal. Uh, it's a Universal movie. He was a Universal contract player. And since Kino Lorber has started doing, you know, the noir sets and just things like this, they are really mining that Universal catalog. By the way, if you want to know more about Kino Lorber and how licensing deals work, stay tuned because I asked that question. Uh, and that thing that is coming soon. Uh, it's brand new 2K Master. And um, what we audio commentary by David Del Val, film historian, filmmaker Daniel Kramer, theatrical trailer, uh, 1958. This is who who directed this? Richard Wilson. I was wondering if it was a Joseph Pevney movie. Sometimes I feel like for a while there, you get into like 1957, 1958. Like one in every five movies feels like it was directed by Joseph Pevney, or maybe that's just the way that the license, the the, the releases are working out. Uh, Marco Polo. Marco Polo. Just, I'm sorry. You, you tune in a little bit for the cheesy humor, right? Because I just don't care. Like, I, I'm going to make the Mark. I hold up the Marco Polo Blu-ray. I'm going to make the Marco Polo joke. I'm not going to not do it. Rory Calhoun, Yoko Tani. Uh, if you're following my Westerns, my weekend Westerns, which I don't do it every weekend, but uh, I've done two Rory Calhoun Westerns just in the last month, I guess. Uh, Rory Calhoun, I really like Rory Calhoun. He was a movie star who transitioned into television. He did a lot of westerns in the 50s. Transitioned to television for The Texan. Um, and that was a two-season show. And then went back to the pictures and became a you know, movie star again. He didn't. He stayed off of the movie screen while he was doing the TV series. Uh, for Desilu, by the way, it was a Desilu uh, release show. So there's Lucille Ball again, Desi and, and Lucy. Um, but anyway, so he goes back to movies. Then he does stuff like Marco Polo. He does, uh, was it the Colossus of Rhodes that he's in? Anyway, uh, the Peplum movies and things like that. So he, I, I just really like Rory Calhoun. So this is 1962. This is under the Kino Cult label. Licensed from Unitas Jolly Film. Uh, it's a foreign film. This is Italian, I'm assuming. So, uh, directed by Hugo 
Fregonese and Piero Pierotti. That sounds Italian. Uh, audio commentary by novelist and critic Tim Lucas. Theatrical trailer, newly restored in 4K. Uh, does not say from what elements, but um, I dig this stuff, man. These these 50. This is the kind of okay. I'll say this: these movies in Europe, uh, European studios are watching what's going on in America with the biblical epics, the Ten Commandments, the second Ten Commandments reference, and they are taking the epic nature from them and trying to make their own epics with them, and that's the peplum genre, which I really want to see. It's getting it's getting a little bit more respect, but I want to see it continue to grow, and uh, then those a lot of those guys transition from peplum into spaghetti westerns, and then into crime and giallo and all that stuff it's like the same people you just follow the genres as they evolve from the the 50s into the 60s into the 70s into the 80s it's crazy but it's really cool uh barbara hershey a world apart have not seen this i don't know a whole lot about the south africa 1963 communist gus roth well i don't want to watch this uh is forced to flee johannesburg to escape arrest okay this is gonna be a very politically charged film uh 1988 uh, I can't read. Directed by Chris Min- Minces, Minges. We got uh, audio commentary by screenwriter Sean Slovo, moderated by historian and filmmaker Daniel Kramer. Interview with actor Jerome Crabb. Uh, who's seen this? What do you guys think about it? Let's talk about it if you have seen it. All right, we're getting e- now we're getting into the cult stuff. We're getting into the fringes. And I love this line. This is the Kino Classics in association with something weird. Uh, this is new to, so this there, what do they call these? What is the line for this? I don't know if this line has a, has a, it's there, it's there something weird collaborations. This is the 14th in the line and they're nudie movies. They're, they're straight up nudie movies, but they're done from the, so this is 1961. Let's see. Back to nature is 1955. That's nine minutes. That's a bonus short. Oh, hold on. Nudist life is uh, 1961. It's 72 minutes. 10 days in a nudist camp is 1957. That's 61 minutes. Shangri-La is 1961. That's 63 minutes. And then we've got bonus shorts uh, from 1955, 1938, 1952. Uh, nudes, nudists and nudism around the world is 13 minutes long. Nudist memories. Arnold Miller, 1961, 17 minutes. These are straight up exploitation movies. For me, they're not really like... I'm trying to think how to say this in a way that won't get me in trouble on YouTube or with people that watch these videos with their kids because that's a thing that happens for sure. Um, They are not exciting necessarily. They are just interesting at how exploitation has worked through the centuries. Because like, so Nudist Life, which I watched, they, here's how they do it. They like, it's like a nudism is nothing. It's kind of like the, the fifties announcer guy, even though it's 1961 nudism is nothing new. Nude people have existed all around the world since the dawn of time. Look at this Pacific Island and they don't care what's it. And then they show like foot, they've mixed thirties footage, like national geographic footage. And then they're like, but it's not just overseas. It's also at home. Oh, Becky's check again to a nudist camp. That kind of a thing. The happy strings music, the string, all the music comes from, you know, public domain archives that they could just, it's a, like it cuts off in the middle of a song and a new song starts. Super, super cheap. But it has, I mean, it's a moment in time captured. Uh, they filmed on these, like what Doris Wishman was doing with her 60s nudie cutie movies. I think it's fascinating, like Nude on the Moon and stuff like that. It's a fascinating pop culture snapshot. Uh, and they are really, I mean, they have really loaded this thing up with a ton of stuff. So, um, am I endorsing? I hey, you do what's right for you for what it is. They really, they really know what they're doing. Uh, from Cohen film collection. This is love on the ground by Jacques Rivette. Uh, have not watched this. This is a 1983 film, uh, with, uh, here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna hold this up. I'm gonna flip it. You can freeze it. From Raro Video, or Raro Video, however you want to pronounce it, uh, is uh, Let's Hope It's a Girl, or do I do the Italians? Speriamo che sia femminina. So this is a 1986 movie uh, from Italy with any features here? No features. But you know, like gender comedy from Italy in the 80s. This, you guys, oh, there's plastic on it. 
uh, The Werewolf of Washington. This is a very, I'm going to say it's infamous. This is a 1973 movie starring Dean Stockwell where he's like, he becomes a werewolf in Washington. And it's, what's funny is to read reviews for this movie because people go in expecting horror, which I mean it is, but... Do you not get the werewolf of Washington? Like, look at that poster, right? And then, like the po the original poster, which is not here, uh, but it's I think it's one of the original posters. It's like the werewolf. He's like he's like a white faced werewolf, white hair and everything, and he's got like the Uncle Sam hat on. Like, it's a satire of politics. That's what it, it's a it's a satire. Watergate was going on at this time. What it, I get disturbed sometimes that people don't read satire. They don't understand like satire. It, okay, just. We're just talking here, right? Satire is a joking look, a humorous look at the real world with a to make a commentary on the world, right? It's commenting. It's always sunny in Philadelphia is a satire. They are they are making fun of horrible people on that show. It's funny. The things they do are funny, but it's commenting on things that they see in real life. South Park is satire. Uh it's commenting on society. It's satirical. That's so a werewolf of Washington. It was funny to read reviews for this because people were like it wasn't very scary, and it just looked like it was really cheap. I'm like it's a comedy about corrupt politics. And like, anyway, so Dean Stockwell, you know, the same energy that he brings to. Um... Oh, you guys, what's that movie? I just reviewed it too. It's the. Uh... <sighs> the movie where he is like uh, the 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 hp lovecraft movie you know what i'm talking about hopefully you know what i'm talking i can't think of the name of it right now all right so this is out it's got a ton of stuff you guys it's got a 2021 director's cut uh 74 minutes the original theatrical presentation was 80 let's see i'm looking for it 89 minutes on the theatrical cut and the director has cut it to 74 minutes in 2021 you got both versions. You don't have to choose. Or you can choose, but like you don't have to watch the revisionist version. 2K restoration of the original theatrical version. Interview with uh, different people. Critical discussion. A 19-minute critical discussion on this movie. This is another interesting one for me. This is Kino Classics Congress Dances. This is a German movie from 1932. And... Uh, Pre-code rules don't really apply here because it's not really dealing with a code as American films would, but it is um, playfully sexy, I guess you'd say. Anyway, I'm going to flip here, flip it around, let you guys check it out. It comes from the F.W. Murnau Stiftung. Is that going to be like the foundation? I don't speak German. Who speaks German? I know some of you guys do. Uh, a film by Chase Joint, Framing Agnes, is a, looks, this is a movie about, there's this point trans, one of the most captivating documentaries I've, I've seen, let's see, the pseudon pseudonymous Agnes was a pioneering transgender woman who participated in an infamous gender health study conducted at UCLA in the 60s, that's what this is, you tell I breeze quickly through the politically charged things because I know I know my audience and I know that I don't want to fight to break out so be nice in the comments be nice um, those who want to pick that up you know about it you can pick it up those who don't you don't have to I'm just sharing the news of what's out this is a, a life's work a film about taking the long view it's really interesting uh, what it's like to dedicate your life to work that won't be completed in your lifetime over the course of 15 years uh, filmmaker David Licata focuses on four projects and the people behind them in an effort to answer this universal question so it's people working on things that will not be finished in their lifetime uh, documentary there are eight gospel music tracks all right Almost done. We got two more here. Kelsey Grammer and High Expectations. I'm noticing Kelsey Grammer is doing a lot of inspirational movies now, and I think that's very interesting. Um, I just, I like, I have questions about that, and I'm not judging one way or the other. But like, let's say you're coming off of Frasier, the X Men movies uh, to do inspirational movies. That's really interesting. So there's got to be a reason for it. Um, I'm curious about that. So this is a um, here. Music is involved. Like music as a career path. And then here, last but not least, Calendar Girls. This is about real women over a life affirming documentary about Florida's most dedicated dance team for women over 60. Uh, the Calendar Girls perform at over 100 events every year. This is a documentary of the 
story. So here's the, uh, the back of the box. All right, guys, that's 25 releases, and one of those was a four-pack of Truffaut movies. So let's talk about it in the comments below. What have you seen? What do you recommend? Uh, we could talk about pre-codes. We could talk about German movies from 1930s. <laughs> the the 1930s. So the WC, WC Fields. German movies from the 1930s. Uh, so much to talk about here. Uh, Truffaut. Kenny Wilber releasing Truffaut. Uh, watch out, fancy labels. <laughs> Kenny Wilber is releasing Truffaut. They're on your tail. Um, do you know what my shirt is it a reference to? What, do you know what band went by Wicked Lester in their pre-fame days? Let's talk about it in the comments below. Guys, thanks so much. Take care. Until next time, I will catch you later.